All right. So with that, I think uh, I will introduce uh, the episode. So this is Religion and the Movies, and I'm looking forward to uh, hearing from our guests. Uh, my name is Ray Herbersky. So I'm a professor of history here at IUPUI. Uh, I also direct American Studies and have written about and still write about religion and the movies, mostly the movies, not so much religion. But our guests are deeply involved in the intersection between religious studies, transmedia studies, uh, and, and religion. So, so let's get started. So we have three guests today, Jeanette Reedy Solano, uh, Rachel Wagner, and Christian Peterson. They will speak in turn, as I, as I just uh, listed them, and they will introduce themselves so they can uh, give you an idea of what they're up to, what they're interested in, and what they're going to be talking about today. So with that, Jeanette, why don't you start us off? <clears throat> Good afternoon. Welcome from, I'm really delighted to be here. I'm in Soggy, California, joining you all, and I'm really excited to meet together with old friends and new ones across the country and talk about my favorite topic, which is film and movies and religion as a religious studies professor. So how did it all start? Well, I was born in Hollywood and I um, first made the connection between religion and film sitting on the floor in Hyde Park in my professor's den. And we were watching Andre Rublev. And it was the first time I understood film could be a way to get the religion religion that I was studying to understand ideas like icons and faith and orthodoxy. Um, so it, that was the first connection moment. It wasn't until uh, much later in my journey as a scholar that I became interested. Well, about a decade later, I joined the AAR, American Academy of Religion group on, and this is where I met my colleagues here today, um, Religion, Film and Visual Culture group in about 2008. Uh, Oh, I wanted to share. Can I share? I wanted to share something with you guys. Okay, sorry, I got so excited to share with you. I didn't share my screen. So I'm going to share this because I do have a few images to go along today. So, is everybody seeing the screen now? I hope. So, um, back to joining this group in 2008. And uh, about 2010, you'll see the image on the right. I directed my first, I crossed over the creative divide from scholar to creative and directed and produced my first film with Homeboy Industries Poets. And so there I am directing a film. And on the left-hand side, you have uh, my new book, Religion and Film, The Basics, which I'm really excited to share and talk with you today. So I have been tasked with sharing just a basic overview of religion and film. And so I am going to just briefly go over the stages that I see the field um, having gone through. So um, is that all right right now to do that right now, Ray? You want me to do that now, correct? Yes, go ahead, Jen. Okay, so here we are, Charlie Chaplin's The Pilgrim in the background, one of the early films. And indeed, there was an early connection. People have been talking about religion and film for over a century. Um, it's nothing new. In fact, when it first came out, people were excited. Uh, Herbert Jump said, wrote about the religious possibilities in the motion picture way back in 1910. Um, in the 1950s, the French film critic and theorist Bazin began his essay, Cinema and Theology, by declaring the cinema has always been interested in it by God, by which he meant not only have religious stories inspired much of early cinema, you think of DeMille's films and Griffith, et cetera, but that film captures reality and all of reality is full of the imminence of God. He spoke of films as a quote, kind of miracle and referred to film as a phenomenon of salvation and grace. So the 1960s to the 1980s were when academic study of religion and film really began to emerge. This era primarily was a Christian theological approach where they would take an idea like salvation or redemption or savior figures, and they'd find the films that fit their ideas. They mostly approached it as literary works and um, went to work on them. The 1970s brought people like Paul Schrader, who was a, a, a filmmaker himself, and, and there was early maturation in the sense that he began in his 1972 master's thesis, Transcendental Style in Film, he began to look at film form and he argued that a film style 
could lead to transcendence rather than just its content. 1982, so we're talking 50 years ago, folks, um, brought the first edited volume of Religion in Film. It was called Religion in Film, um, edited by May and Bird. By the 1990s, um, there was definitely methodological maturation and expansion. Um, up until this point, mostly the work of art film directors like Ozu and Dreyer were used, but there's a shift in the 1980s and they started looking at films that were more popular in nature, like Star Wars. Um, by the 1990s, people were expanding into more popular culture work. And I know that um, Rachel's gonna talk about that. And also Margaret Miles came out in 1993 with Seeing and Believing, Religion and Values in the Movies. And this was an important shift in maturation in the sense that it was the first time somebody was using cultural studies to apply to understanding religion and film. Um, so she looked at the works of auteurs, she looked at the, the circuit of culture, et cetera. She chose films that portrayed pressing social anxieties. And this will get to our later question in the podcast about why does this matter and why is film important to study? Um, in 1997, there was the creation of the group I mentioned earlier, the AAR, Religion, Film and Visual Culture Group. And it was also the year that the Journal of Religion and Film was first published and became the first academic peer reviewed. Um, Jumping to the 2000s, my last stage, the last 20 years in religion and film, um, there's been a lot of diversification. The first century brought really wonderful readers in religion and film by Leiden and S. Brent Plate. Um, I think everyone began to get more nuanced in understanding film theory, critical methodology for approaching it, the real spirituality. Um, Institute was established at Fuller Seminary, and this was a public intellectual exercise of screening films and talking about them with filmmakers. Um, so just a lot more engagement of world cinema, and many universities started teaching religion and film. And then um, my final point, how am I doing on time, Ray? My, out my six minutes or five yeah, minutes? Just, yeah, just wrap it oh, up when you can. Yep. Wrap it up. Okay. Just basically the last 20 years have seen tremendous growth. No longer is it solely Christian theological people. We have wonderful works in Judaism and Buddhism, um, et cetera, and also real maturation engagement with uh, film theory, cinema history and author studies, genre studies, wonderful works on horror and religion, et cetera, and um, looking at film elements like Cutter Calloway's Music and Transcendence. So lots of exciting development over the past 50 years of religion and film. Jeanette, thanks very much. It's an excellent way to start us off. All right, Rachel Wagner, you're up. We can't hear you, Rachel, I have to unmute, yep. Sorry about that. Um, sorry, so this is my book. Um, you may um, know it, you may not. I deal with film there some, but I also just deal with screen cultures more generally. I do deal with the question of interactivity. And this book actually was born in part out of reading um, John Lydon's work on religion and film. And he was talking about interactivity, Brent played as well. And I thought, well, if there's interactivity and immersion in films, how much more so in games? And so what I'm going to do is to talk a little bit about um, transmedia as a sort of conceptual tool for what I think can be one of the most important um, new phases in the study of religion and culture generally, but film is obviously part of that. So this diagram is not my production, but it does give you a visual of how to think about transmedia. Now, most people know transmedia. They understand that there's a Star Wars universe and that there are all different sorts of media that contribute to a core story world. Same thing with Harry Potter, there's books, there's films. Um, you can imagine entry into that world. So the notion or the idea of world building and the study of world building, particularly the work of Mark J.P. Wolf is really important to me. And religion, of course, is also world building. So it's a really rich thing to think about. 
Um, you can enter into the theme park. You can like literally take your body and put it inside something that is right, taking the shape of the Harry Potter world. So there's an element of belief and performance and entry um, involved in transmedia. So if it will let me just back up, I'll go back up um, to the model. And now this probably seems intuitive to you. Yes, there's a core story world. Yes, it's delivered and experienced in all of these different kinds of ways. Um, and so that's what I do. So film is one of the ways, right, that we can think about world building. And so my next book, which I'm going to talk about more in the next question, um, is thinking about not just story worlds that are delivered to us in a sort of fully formed mode, right? Like here's the Harry Potter world. You know, it's been thought up by JK Rowling. It's been developed by filmmakers and then we receive it and we can participate in it. I'm really interested in uh, the ways that story universes can be perpetuated as a sort of ideology or the one I'm interested in a sort of national mythology. So I'm, I'm going to talk about what I call the cowboy apocalypse, which is a story that we can recognize by first looking at the many different ways in which it's delivered. And that will include films, post-apocalyptic films. It will include all different kinds of things. I'll give you some examples in a moment, but I will go down here to the end. Avatar is another example. We're even imagine, we're supposed to imagine ourselves entering into other bodies, other worlds. There was this political activity after the first film, this is a Palestinian protest. And so they're using the film as a means to make a political statement and embodying, right, material from the film. So Brent Plait, um, Robert Orsi, Birgit Meyer, these are all scholars that have talked about the sensational, the, the physical or the material palpable quality of film. And that's one of the things that I'm interested in. Um, there's another example, Handmaid's Tale, stepping off the screen, you're putting yourself into the story in real life, not a film, but it is visual, um, making political statements. I'm interested in the gun, how, how and in what circumstances does the gun step off the screen as part of a larger mythic construct, and like I said, I'll say more about that in a moment when we get to method, but I will leave you with this photo of me and the title of my next book. Um, for some reason that I cannot explain because I have not asked them and I do not want to. My parents let me hold an actual gun as a toddler. Um, and so guns were very much a part of my experience growing up and real guns do real damage, right? Filmic guns might teach you habits, but they don't actually shoot. So these are some of the things that I think about in the book and I will return to them when we come back to talk about method. I think I've stopped sharing. Is that true? Okay. All right, Ray, you're silenced, but I think I'm up next. Sorry, Christian, you're up next, sorry. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen here too. And uh, wanted to thank everybody involved for uh, including me and Ray and everybody um, at Religion and American Culture for uh, for inviting me. So I am very much uh, interested in religion and the movies, uh, and as all of us have, and many of you who uh, who are watching, uh, I kind of entered this by teaching, uh, starting to teach uh, religion and film courses. And then I had the great privilege of, of working at the University of Nebraska uh, at Omaha, where we have the uh, the illustrious uh, Bill Blizek, who was the founder of the Journal of Religion and Film, and I uh, learned a great deal from him. And it was a, a, a place where I was really encouraged to kind of throw my hat in to uh, kind of try and explore this research myself. And I continue that work uh, under the leadership of John Lydon as the, the book review editor for there. So uh, if you are interested in reviewing a book, please get in touch. I'm always looking for reviewers. But um, for me, uh, since I'm in Islamic studies, I um, was very interested in how Islam fits into this conversation. 
And uh, since uh, those many years ago and starting this work, um, I've edited a couple books uh, on the subject, um, two that came out in 2021, uh, Muslims uh, in the movie, Movies and New Approaches to Islam in the Film. Um, and then at the end of this year, um, with uh, my co-editor Hussein Rashid, we have the Blooms of Very Handbook of uh, Muslims and Popular Culture coming out. And we have a handful of articles on Muslims in film there. Um, what, I, what I found was um, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, diversity in the scholarship on Muslims in film when I started teaching in the early, uh, you know, mid-2000, mid the mid-aughts. Um, a lot of it was on basically all of the negative representation of Muslims. Uh, which makes sense because there, there really wasn't a lot uh, happening otherwise. Um, what, what I thought would be useful uh, for the moment here is just kind of outlining um, kind of this history. Uh, there, there is actually a pretty long history of Muslims and the movies uh, pretty much from the beginning. Um, and I've tried to kind of do a little bit of periodization. So um uh, the, the kind of first period that we have, we might think of this as uh, a thousand and one nights type of period, or maybe even a quote unquote mystic East type of period that kind of reflects those uh, orientalist ideas uh, in general. But we start to have these uh, coming out in the early 1920s. There's a, a handful of films uh, before this, but really it's from the 20s that we start to have this kind of repeated representation. Um, there we have these kind of magical or fantastic, sometimes even kind of monstrous uh, types of representations of, of Muslims that are extending from this kind of fantastic world. Um, these Muslim spaces uh, as they're depicted are these exotic sites, uh, usually of great risk and danger. This same kind of trope of risk and danger uh, transitions starting around the 1970s, although we have a few, um, you know, kind of instances a little bit earlier than that, but really it's in the 1970s. And then we could say up until today that we have uh, this kind of terrorism and violence type of trope that's uh, repeated um, from who I saw was here. You are all likely uh, familiar with many of these films. Um, the, this kind of exotic land becomes more uh, primitive and barren in many of these places. So even in like if we're dealing with large cities uh, like Karachi or we're dealing with Baghdad or something like this, it still looks like uh, what Jack Shaheen calls Arab land, you know, deserts and oases and kind of run down this kind of thing. Uh, it's often characterized by war and turmoil. Um, Muslim men in these uh, contexts are often depicted as uh, angry and lecherous and hyper-masculine um, and always unap up, unapologetically violent. Uh, Muslim women are depicted as oppressed and agentless. Uh, they are simultaneously uh, both sexually unavailable, but also highly promiscuous, uh, which is an in in interesting tension there, uh, but always the object of, of male gaze. Um, so it, it makes sense that much of this early scholarship was dealing with uh, this, this overwhelming uh, negative representation. Um, where we start to see some shift is in uh, basically a post 9-11 world. Um, one of the, the my favorite scholars who's working on this topic, Evelyn El Sultani, uh, she offers this idea of a simplified complex representations. Um, this is when we have positive Muslims, they're always put in the framework of the war on terror. So they are, you know, even though they're good, they're good because they're helping fight the terrorists. They're good because they're, you know, informants. They're good because perhaps they are the victims of, uh, you know, quote unquote, Islamic terrorism. So it is still this very narrow and limited uh, representational uh context in which they can exist. And then most recently, we have, again, from uh, Evelyn El Sultani, she's coined this phrase, uh, crisis diversity. And here we're talking about the kind of opening up uh, that largely started, I mean, there was, a, again, a few instances before this, 
uh, but a uh, around the 2016 election season in uh, America, and then really solidified by things like the so-called Muslim ban. Uh, we have uh, an opening up to Muslim creatives actually creating their own representations uh, that 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 perhaps can be seen in more authentic ways. Um, although this, of course, because of the di diversity of Muslims, uh, there's no way that even a dozen shows or, or, you know, a dozen films is able to kind of uh, feel representative for this you know, this kind of vast and diverse uh, Muslim population. So um, I have other stuff, but that's longer than I thought. It no, this take. is good. No, so I think uh, so, Rachel, I think Christian has sort of gotten us head in the direction of the stake. What's at stake? when all of you are thinking about the intersection between religious studies and and some you know movies film uh transmedia but can you speak to a bit more about that like what what how do you see uh, the stakes in the kind of work you do sure um sorry but my powerpoint walked away uh, well i guess i'll talk without it um so, um, yes, what's at stake? Well, I, what I will do is I will gesture because the first thing I wanted to do was um, explain about the cowboy apocalypse and the way there it's transmedia. So I want you to have that sort of image in your mind that there's a core story world that's being delivered in lots of different ways. But when we think about that core story world itself, um, then I see a sort of um, national mythology at work and it draws on the myth of the frontier. And then we're in sort of our present time, right in the middle and the apocalyptic expectation. And this is largely a nationalist NRA, right? Um, gun enthusiast story, not all gun owners, but a certain stripe of them. Um, they're looking towards a future, a post-apocalyptic future where that frontier will return. So think walking dead, think cowboy hats, think guns, think the world will be decimated and what will be left. I was thinking of your desert. The desert sometimes signifies the frontier as well, right? And so if you're thinking about the Middle East, Middle East sort of identified as a place of resources, right? To be mined, then there actually is a really interesting parallel there in the mythology. But the idea is frontier, present time, apocalyptic hope indeed because when we return to that post-apocalyptic frontier men will be in charge guns can be fired freely women will know their place right there'll be these small compounds no government so it represents this kind of fantasy for a certain kind um of of gun enthusiast i'll say and so you know in the pictures i had some walking dead images some nra good guy with a gun um slogans right because it, this mythology of a good guy versus a bad guy can be part of that apocalyptic story and indeed here it is um zombie apocalyptic stuff um yeah and so that's that's largely what i had was some images there um so what's at stake is understanding the role of the gun and so in the book, I move from the most static or fixed form of mediation through to the gun as a sort of incarnational device, an object that literally passes from this imagined other world that's created fictionally and also desired to truly come to be. It passes and materializes in our world. And so it becomes a ritual tool of authentication of that desired future. So there's this sort of tilting towards the future and then the feeling that one can enact that future in the here and now because we're on this cusp, on this edge before we tilt into that future. So one of the chapters I interpret um, the riot on January 6th um, at the Capitol as a role play, right? Sort of this desire to enter into this story as fully as possible. Um, films, of course, you can see guns on screen. Um, in the book, I talk about being able to get replicas of John Wayne's revolver, right? That kind of thing. And that's a sort of play. But when you're talking about actual guns, right? When you move from a book, a Western, into, you know, NRA target practice or even into an actual protest activity where you're actually armed, something important has happened. 
And religion can help us because religion is very interested in how other worlds materialize and how we materialize our imagination of other worlds. So I'll stop there. There's more I could say, but- So Rachel, just, is, is the gun then uh, a transitional totem of some kind? Yeah. Yeah, okay. but I want to give it richer resonance yes. than that. Yes. It is central but, to a ritual, but it is actually mm -hmm. helping create yes. what should be I the think next. So. Yes. For some okay. people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fascinating. Okay. Christian, you you clearly feel that the arc of of Muslims or the depiction of Islam in the movies has reached some sort of stage where people are um they're facing things that they either have uh, avoided or they've popularized in sort of a grotesque way. But, so where are we uh, in, in, in the arc now? What, what do you feel like um, is at stake with, with what is being shown about the Islamic world or Muslims that, I mean, let's face it, that it, the audience, at least in the United States, is engaging in right now or engaging with? Yeah, so, um, you know, in in general, uh, part of why I think this scholarship is really useful is, uh, to me, film both uh, reflects kind of how society works, um, but it also really transforms society. It, it has real effects. Um, so, it, you know, to me, it's an important site for understanding, uh, you know, how religion is constructed and deployed within contemporary culture. Um, in re regard to Muslims, this, uh, I think, is especially important because of this long kind of very negative uh, history. Uh, it constructs a public understanding of Muslims. Um, in for, for lots of Americans who don't either encounter Muslims or perhaps they don't know when they go to Dr. Khan, they don't realize Dr. Khan is a Muslim, right? They just think of him perhaps as a, you know, a so-called other. But um, so for a lot of people, I think, uh, film, television, news, media in general, uh, really shapes and creates these negative stereotypes um, and then reinforces them by, uh, you know, adding to anti-Muslim sentiment, um, but also thinking more structurally, um, basically enabling people to support anti-Muslim policies. Uh, things like surveillance, where we have, uh, you know, we, there's lots of evidence of this in counterterrorism programs. Um, there was a big surveillance um, uh, operation by the NYPD. Uh, it helps sustain anti-immigration um, types of policies like, like the, the Muslim ban, uh, but also we saw this during the kind of the height of the Syrian crisis. Um, it allows people to say we should detain people, right? We still literally have people in Guantanamo Bay uh, that have never been charged with anything because of their... Uh, you know, supposed suspicion of nefarious uh, things that are kind of rooted in our notions about what Islam is all about. So uh, yeah, I think all of this has a lot of, um, you know, effect on how our, our our communities kind of interact, how people understand uh, people that are, are are not part of their community, thinking in, in terms of insiders and outsiders of the, the Muslim community. Um, and there's there's been uh, I mean, a lot of research like Pew Research, mm -hmm. other things have shown that, um, you know, a lot of Americans view Muslims very skeptically or uh, uh, poorly. You know, Pew uses these kind of weird terms sometimes like the, uh, I forget what what the one was. It was like the cool monitor, the hot cool monitor, right? They were the lowest on the cool monitor below atheists and Mormons and, and all other kind of religious groups. Um, there's other polls that, you know, a significant majority of Americans say that they think groups like ISIS represent a, you know, authentic or true representation of what Islam is all about. So um, I, I think it has a lot of social effects. Um, so, you know, without going in uh, to what I'm working on myself, um, you know, this is why I think it is important that we're shifting towards these more uh, Muslim-centered voices in the creation and production of, uh, you know, visual depictions of Muslims. Is there one example that you use in class that seems to be effective with students? In, for which part? Well, I would, I would think compli uh, complicated, I mean, not reinforcing the image of Islam or Muslims, but complicating it. Is there one 
film or one filmmaker or one genre? There's, there's lots. So, uh, okay. you know, recently there's been, um, you know, a number of TV shows. So kind of as Rachel was saying, right, screen culture is more broadly. Okay. Uh, I think in, in general, there seems to be a move away from film towards uh, kind of cinematic television mm. or even just with streaming. It seems that a lot of places would rather do television. So uh, there's been a lot of recent uh, shows like Rami. Mm -hmm. uh, we Are Lady Parts is a, a British um a british show these are mostly comedies um mo is another recent one that's on uh netflix uh so there's lots and then you know there are lots of films um that have come out that kind of complicate but uh, all of them in general par part of i think what's important about them is they show that muslims are dynamic they're complicated they're diverse they're very pious Muslims. There's very non-pious Muslims, right? There's uh, Muslims that dress in particular ways. There's Muslims that dress in other ways, right? There's all sorts of uh, diversity, which, uh, you know, kind of throws this sense of authenticity up in yeah. the air because it's authentic to who. Um, but yes, yeah, so there's, there's, there's lots of, lots of good stuff that is happening. All right, we can avoid the anniversary of celebrating Hollywood. That happens every year. Uh, the Oscars just took place. It was perhaps somewhat unique in the history of, of the show. But Jeanette, what do we make of, of the Oscars in general? And maybe, you know, this last one. What kind of, what kind of uh, ideas did you have coming out of that? of that latest in, in still installment of the Oscars. All right, let's make it real. Okay, um, let's see, this will open up. I think it takes a minute to load, but yes, I'm excited to talk about the Oscars with all of you and with our audience and- Okay, so it's um, still showing two screens in some ways. No, so why is that? Mine looks, mine looks totally full. Right, so um, it's okay. I mean, we, we can see both, uh, uh, both slides, but if that's okay. Uh, this fills my screen, but it doesn't fill your screen. I'm sorry. But can you see the two images before you? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So why do film summer from Guantanamo Bay to Hollywood? Here we go. What a segue. <laughs> but the idea of why does any of this matter um, for scholars of religion and, and folks that are interested is because film and visual culture from television to film have profound effects. And I'd like to back up to talking about how films are actually a mirror of what's going on in culture. So on the, the image on your left is actually a scene from someone I discussed in my book, Religion and Film, The Basics, Lois Weber's 19, 1915 film, The Hypocrites. And in that, it was a scandal because she had a naked woman being the naked truth. And she goes throughout the silent film, holding her mirror up to the hypocrisy from politics to um, lovers who are not being honest with one another. She holds up her mirror. And I think films do that. They hold up a mirror, as um, I mentioned in the book in 1993, uh, shows what we're anxious about. So the image on the right is Jordan Peele's uh, mirror. Obviously, most of you have probably seen Get Out. And it's a mirror held up to the horror of racism with a, a cool veneer um, in our culture and was a horror film that engendered much conversation. So film production and accolades like the Oscars they, they are moments that we can hold up to a mirror and reflect on the imbalances of power in our culture. So we focus just on religion and race. I'm sorry, this isn't very better. On the left, you have an image from Broken Blossoms and you have the hashtag movement Oscar So White. So I wanna talk focus a little more and this directly relates to my colleagues work on religion and race. Um, so films like Green Book, the Oscars are granted at Best Picture, Get Out, Us, um, or Burden, they're films that engender conversations about deep-seated racism in our society. Um, so the Oscars So White was actually a, uh, a Twitter movement that went viral. It was started in January, 2015, um, in response to all 20 acting nominations going to only white people in the Academy Awards. So this went viral and it got people talking um, and it was the right moment in our culture's time to really face it. So critics of the Academy asserted that nothing's going to change in Hollywood or the production of films as long as the voting membership of the Academy um, is, remains mostly white men. 
So in response to this announcement, the Academy responded in 2016, said, we're going to change things. We're going to um, bring more diversity into the voting powers that be. And so by June, they started an initiative. They invited many, many people. Um, the new member class, for instance, in 2020 uh, of the voting body was 45% women, 36% underrepresented ethnic racial communities, and 49% international filmmakers from 68 countries. So they announced by 2020, they had surpassed their goals in inclusion. And here you have on the slide, the number of women doubled. Um, it's now 33% of all members and people of color tripled from 554 to um, 1700 in 2020, representing 20% of the voting membership of the Academy. Um, and they represent people of color, 43% of the US population. So yes, there's progress. Um, but biopic, BIPOC film representation and those behind the camera, and we can talk about that too, still has a long way to go to reflect the population and especially those who are purchasing the tickets and watching the shows um, and consuming the media. So what happened on Sunday? Um, Asians in film, we just focus on Asians. Uh, on Sunday, I'm curious to see how many of you watched the Oscars this past Sunday. There was an affable Jimmy Kimmel, kept things light and folks laughing. There were bewildered donkeys um, and Bollywood dancers, which were awesome. And, it, and we can talk about RRR if you want to, too. There were plenty of movie stars, but the big story was this film. Everything, everywhere, all at once. A film I have seen four times now. <laughs> and I can tell you why if you want to. Um, later, but and an, a very interesting film. Everybody's talking about the Asian wave happening with the Oscars, and it began with Crazy Rich Asians in 2019. It was followed the next year by Parasites um, winning top Oscars in 2020. It won Best Picture, which was the first time a foreign language film won an Oscar for Best Picture um, in 90 plus years of the Academy Awards. It won Best Original Screenplay, which is huge as well. And the director, Bong Joon-ho, won um, Best Director. He was the second Asian man to do so. Um, so last year, there was also a stepping stone. The, what I'm writing on right now is Minari by Lee Isaac Chung. It, it was a film, a little indie film, $2 million budget. And um, it talks about growing up in Arkansas, uh, a, a Korean-American family um, and their, their story trying to make it in Arkansas. So it was nominated for six Oscars and it won one. And so on the left, the image you have on the left is the excitement of, um, of Yoon Yoon Jung winning Best Supporting Actress last year. And the slide on the right is the cast that really swept the Oscars this year. And the movie was everything everywhere all at once. Um, why is it significant? Um, first of all, it's the first time an Asian uh, let's see, an Asian woman won Best Actor for act, Best Actress. So Michelle Yeoh won Best Actress. Um, Dan Kwan was the first Asian man to win for writing and directing. And um, it was just a really exciting moment. So to sum up, film awards matter. Um, why should we even care about the Oscars? They matter because to some degree, they reflect what we value, or at least who holds the power. Oscar So White questioned this, and it brought about change. So stop there. And Great. Thanks, Jeanette. Okay. Uh, Rachel, do you do you want to add anything to our little Oscar conversation here? Um, no, but I'm going to throw out um, an idea and we'll see what happens. Maybe people will just think about it. Um, it's about this notion of mirroring. Right. And I'm thinking about I'm thinking about what Christian was saying and about representation of Muslims. Right. And so that representation is problematic and often inaccurate. Right. Um, and then in other cases, we can view film as a reflection or a mirror of society. If we think about it in terms of power, then misrepresentations can be a kind of mirror. But I'm interested in films that serve the purpose of perpetuating, right, um, fantasies, basically, for the people who enjoy them. So I'm thinking about sort of the different ways, right, that films may interact with reality. Um, so I'll just throw that out there. Don't have anything about the Oscars in particular, so feel free to go That's back fine. to it. No, so I think we wanted to turn to the idea of methodology, methodologies that all of you use in different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, so Christian, do you want to start us off a little bit on, on that? And then uh, I'd like to hear from each one of you. 
Sure. So I'll try and try and be brief. But uh, so as I mentioned, kind of most of the early scholarship in in, in my subfield uh, was kind of cataloging. And uh, Jack Shaheen uh, has this uh, book, Real Bad Arabs, that became a documentary, which uh, is documents this very carefully. But, um, you know, I was hopeful to move beyond this this type of uh, scholarship. Um, the uh, the other place where stuff related to Muslims uh, could have happened, but largely was ignored uh, in terms of like interest in religion, was in film studies in uh, kind of national cinema scholarship. So of course, there's like a great deal of scholarship, you know, on Indonesian cinema or on Nigerian film cultures or um, you know Egyptian or whatever. But uh, for whatever reason. Uh, religion was not centered in ways that kind of said this is important for structuring you know how film is produced what narratives are told how people are, uh, understand them and and for me that's that's what i'm interested in uh so i you know this is uh something that i'm calling uh you know quote unquote muslim cinema uh so this would be film that's structured by local muslim life and informed by inter interpretations of islam uh, either in its production or its consumption. So even stories that are secular that happen in the Muslim majority society, it would still, in my mind, make sense to think about how does Islam structure this social world in which this narrative exists. So, um, you know, I'm I'm interested in that type of work. Um, and I'm interested in that both in, you know, the kind of formal film analysis that probably is the most dominant form of, of scholarship in religion film and thinking about, you know, narrative. And then as, uh, you know, more and more people have moved into thinking about cinematic techniques as well. So how does editing sound, lighting, camera work, these kind of things also communicate understandings or interpretations of religion, or in my case, Islam. So I'm interested in that. Um, but I'm also very interested in kind of the uh, the, the paratextual type of mm. domains around film. So, you know, things like film production, systems of, of support, whether it be activism or financing or things like that, yeah. film circulation in places like festivals or streaming. Um, you know, reception is a really always, uh, you know, a really interesting place to think about it. So, you know, how how does uh, Muslim majority society structure spectatorship right. or what do we think about award recognition? Right. In in the sense of the Oscars, there's only a few Muslims who've been recognized um, in, in that regard um, or protest. Right. Uh, you know a lot about this. Right. Right. Um, religion, uh, <laughs> religious communities often protest these <laughs> types of things as well. So. Um, so those those are the types of things I'm interested in, and I hope that more and more people will kind of explore this, uh, you know, within Islamic studies, think about yeah. film or media more broadly as a kind of uh, ripe domain to explore, you know, how, how do people understand Islam and Muslim uh, lived experience in the contemporary world? That's, that's great, Christian. Thanks for opening up about 15 doors for, <laughs> for scholars there. That's, that's great. All right, Rachel, how about you? Uh, it, uh, just on yeah. Yep, yep. And I think my PowerPoint is back. So um, I'll use it so far as it's helpful. Um, can you, what do you see? Looks like preview mode. There you there go. You, there you go. There's yep. now okay. it's single screen. Yeah. Single All screen. right. So just to put this slide back up, right? Because this is sort of the um, conceptual tool that I use. Um, and I kind of, I don't know. I kind of sneak up on my on my research. I, I use a ton of methods. I, I'll say that my new book, which is under contract with NYU Press as of recently, it'll be out in 2024. Um, it grew out of something in my first book. There's a chapter on violence. There's also a chapter on apocalypticism and video games. Um, and I really wanted to follow up on that question of violence, because it seemed to me that that was one of the things that made that study worthwhile is understanding what's going on with video game violence. So that's where I started. Um, but the more I looked at things, um, and I was looking at apocalypticism as sort of a, a key trope for understanding video game violence. But the more I sat with apocalypticism, the gun just kept showing up. It just kept on showing up. And so I said, fine. 
And I ended up writing a chapter, which I think is the best one in the book called 13 Ways of Looking at a Gun. Um, and I use a whole host of methods there, thinking about a gun as a form of mediation. I call it a one key typewriter. It, you can only hit one key and that key is shoot. And what it says is no. Um, and I use theory from, uh, there's a book called Excommunication, which I adore. It's from communication theorists, Mackenzie Wark, Alexander Galloway, and Eugene Thacker. And they talk about uh, communication as, um, excommunication as communication to shut down communication. So a sort of ritual of I won't talk to you. What does that look like? And they're just talking about media in general, but I thought, oh my gosh, that's what guns do. Even just displaying them is a way of saying, I don't have to talk to you. It's a threat, right? And so a threat is a form of communication. So I've thought a lot about the materiality of the gun and, the, and how that weaves in and out of these different modes of engagement with the story of the cowboy apocalypse. I use Matt Hills, his work on fandom and the paratextual for me, I'm really interested in the stuff, right? Yeah. Um, if I can just jump down here real quickly, I've got Walking Dead uh -huh. stuff. We've got action figures. These are paratexts as well. They're appendages, right? To the key uh, the key text. Um, this is NRA stuff. This is a Walking Dead survival kit. It's a real <laughs> kit, but it's based on a fictional story. Um, and I don't know if I have these in here. Yes, the CDC produced this comic. It's about zombies, but it's meant to help people prepare for a real pandemic. So there's this, this weaving back and forth, right, between the fictional and the real, the imaginary. What is belief? What does it mean to believe? Can you decide to believe? Of course you can, because people do it all the time in religion. So what does it mean to decide to believe in this world that you've constructed that is white nationalist misogyny, right? What do, what do you do with that? Um, so I use Bridget Meyer, her work on sensational forms. I use Latour. He actually writes about a gun at one point. So if we think about the person holding the gun and the gun, as a combined machine or a combined object, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It's one thing, then it does matter what that person mm -hmm. holding the gun thinks or feels. It matters very much. It does matter that he's holding a gun and not a spoon. So oh. the tour is also very helpful. So that's a taste right. of some of the methods that I use. Yeah, Jeanette, why don't you jump in? I just wanna be really um, aware of time. And sure. I know we only have 10 minutes left for questions from our, from our audience. And I wanted this right. to be a dialogue. So I okay. won't share my screen. I will just simply say, please buy my book. It's really <laughs> cheap. And the whole second chapter in this book talks about four methods of approaching um, religion and film. And what I advocate is what I call methodological bricolage which is really forcing those of us who are naturally, yay, naturally, a, a, you know, we'll naturally drift towards, if we have theological training, we'll use the theological biblical. And there's a place for that still. But um, I talk about theological biblical approaches, cultural studies and reception studies, as Christian was mentioning, um, really important. And my students favorite, you know, because they're really adept at, at looking at that production, culture, box office mojo, et cetera, and reception and thinking about how it affects us. There's much work being done on, on how movies affect us. Um, religious studies theories that you incorporate myth and symbol, uh, et cetera, especially Leiden and Brent Plate and talking about world making. And then finally, film studies. I think a lot of us in religion feel the imposter syndrome when we start talking about cinema. Uh, at least I did in the beginning, but I've gotten over it because I'm learning and I'm, I'm learning film history and I've made some films now. and. You know, and so I think just branch, pushing ourselves to branch onto other methodologies is really important um, and um, encourage everyone to do so. That's so I will leave it. I will leave it at that. OK, Are we, do so have, we have time for questions. We do have a question. Uh, this one is for Rachel. Um, do you see the popularity of the gun in The Last of Us as having even more of a direct stake in today's world in that we are looking for a cure to a killing virus, right? Killer COVID. Right. I have not yet seen Last of Us because I'm editing my book. Oh, so oh. I know, I know I need to. It is on my list. Um, I mean, I, I assume that means symbolically. Um, I don't think I'm the best person to answer it because I haven't seen it yet. So I'm not going to guess what happens there. 
Sorry, Ruby. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, uh, I mean, it is an interesting uh, show for the, the, the way that violence is deployed. And I don't think it's, it's as um, uh, The Walking Dead, I think, overall is more violent than The yes. Last of Us. I think there's a lot more relationship building in The Last of Us, which makes, I think, the right. violence even more uh, effective. But, uh, oh, Raymond, I just watched the end, the last episode of The Last of Us, and I have to disagree. The violence, the there's gun, a lot of violence. The yeah. last, the last episode is just like, you know, popping candy. I mean, it's just like, it's yeah. everywhere. I, I don't, you know, you've read but the I agree with you that, about right? the relationship. I do agree with you about the relationship building. It's, it's yeah. powerful. I mean, many people in sort of that universe, right? said that the last episode was quite different from all the other books. Okay, episodes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it really returned to the feel of a, of a video game. Yes, yes, yeah. it does. But so Rachel, point, you that, gotta do that. You gotta watch Me Not in Arkansas. Right. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, for Rachel, not a question, but speaking of fantasy and reality, it's interesting that the CDC publishes Preparedness 101, Zombie Apocalypse. Yeah. you have any comment on that one? <laughs> Yeah, it's really strange. There were also some military trainings that used the zombie trope. And there are people who have written about zombies as sort of representing um, the, the killable other, right? Um, and sort of anyone, and anyone could become a zombie, therefore anyone um, presumably, right, could be, um, could be shot. And I think that is a really problematic um, story uh, reflecting the state of our world. I have a question for all of you that I'm interested in, okay? So I, I work on film critics. Do you care about film critics? Do you care about <laughs> what they say in, in about movies or films or film culture or particular cultures that watch films in a certain way? Is there anybody that you read that might be useful? Because if we were having this conversation 30 or 40 years ago, we'd probably be bringing up some of those people, but mm -hmm. it seems like they have disappeared as a group. You think critics have disappeared? Yeah, I do. I do. Really? No, I still, I, they're very important to me, but I don't let them, I don't uh, worship them. I'm going to say that. I uh, like, so therefore they're no longer I, important enough, right? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I have my favorites. I love Justin Chang. I, I love his writing in the LA Times. So I have my favorites and yes, okay. I do still turn to them. Okay. But I also turn to them secondarily. Fine. <laughs> Damn. Anybody else? Is there anybody else that you read that to help? Oh. Well, in, in my context, um, the one thing that I really like about critics is, um, you know, with the kind of democratization of criticism, uh, there's like tons of Muslims, South Asians, uh, Swana folks that are now saying like, we're sick of this terrible <laughs> representation, right? Or we want this or we want that and very much champion works that they find mm -hmm. to be um, that resonate with them. So uh, I have I have a ton of critics that I follow and read their work and I find very valuable in kind of thinking about, uh, especially as somebody who's kind of an outsider to the community, um, right. you know? It also, I think in my case, um, you know, one of, one of the things I'm really interested in is like these tensions, right? So, uh, for example, there was this film uh, called Hala, it came out in 2019. It was one of the first uh, Apple TV productions. And it's about a young uh, Muslim girl. She's a hijabi uh, who kind of overcomes, uh, you know, the uh, seeming uh, restrictions of her, you know, kind of cloistered family life. Um, it was written and directed by a Muslim uh, female director, right? It seemed to check all the boxes of like, this is what we need in diversity in the film industry, uh, right? It was kind of championed as this. It, it according to many critics uh, and Muslim audiences, it, it replicated a lot of these kind of old stereos and tropes about like the abusive, uh, father about the kind of agentlessness of woman it kind of replicated like these issues of sexuality of, of muslim women uh yeah. so it's really like you know it's important to hear those voices where 
kind of mainstream critics are saying, this is great. This is a wonderful film. Look, we have Muslim representation, uh -huh. not only on the screen, but behind the screen. This is wonderful. And I mean, that was like the dominant review in mainstream uh, reviews. And then of course, there's all this kind of critique within the Muslim community that's saying, this is, this is trash. This is not what we want. <laughs> this is not helping us. This is furthering harm. So, yeah. so yeah, I find, I find a lot of critics really, really important, but yeah, there certainly is this less of like the celebrity critic that, uh, yeah, once for sure. so I, we have one more, we have a question. It's a big one. Uh, John Lydon asks, thank, thank you all. Great to see you and hear from all three of you. I'm also very much focused on violence in film and my research now. If religion is based on violence, as many say, and violence is popular in film as it is, is this a good argument for film as religion? Hmm. Discuss. Of course, that will take us for another hour, but uh, <laughs> we I have think three I minutes. I think I can say something quickly that sort of segues from the one to the other. Um, because I'm very interested in in what makes a film good or oh, a film bad, right? Mm -hmm. What on what grounds do we decide? Because you're asking about the film critics, right? Used to be we could say, okay, this person thinks it's a good film, and I have had to watch a lot of very bad films, <laughs> and there are so many films, right? Um, that um, it's it's hard to assess. So um, one of the things that I wrote down is making versus viewing, right? In response to, to John's question, um, Amerigadon is a vanity film that was funded by Gary Heaven, who owned Curves, and he gets to fly his helicopter around in it. Nobody's reviewing that film because it's, it's garbage. It's terrible, but it does replay the cowboy apocalypse. And so the making of it was a sort of ritualized performance of violence for him. So I'll leave it at that so other people can jump in. But I do think it, that we need to think about film production as well. Good. Jeanette? I, I don't have a lot to say about violence. I tried to avoid it, but it's everywhere. Oh. You know, my students just reacted to the, the animal violence in Andre Rublev. And I'm thinking, I can't show that film anymore, you know? And it's everywhere. It's even in this popular new film. It's extremely violent. Who knew a filing cabinet could be a weapon of death? I mean, I mean, um, there's violence everywhere, and it's so uh, it's so pervasive. I can't avoid it in almost any film that I show. Yeah, Christian, you want the last? Uh, but I, I like John's question about about yeah. the the heart of religion and yeah. violence, and that's a very provocative question. It is. Yeah. Good for a panel, you three. Christian, you want the last word on this one? Um, I, you know, I don't know if the, the violence fits in so much to the religion part of the communities that I'm interested in, uh, you know, where I see violence is in kind of the, the orientalist type stereotypes um, that are often kind of uh, expressed in reception. So, for example, when uh, American Sniper came out, uh, people were like, you know, expressing uh, this motivation for violence against Muslims over and over again on social media and other spaces, um, because in that film, uh, Muslims are so kind of distorted in their kind of agency. And uh, uh, yeah, so I think it can lead to violence. Um, but yeah, it's a tricky question. I, I, I look forward to talking to John more about this. So. Good. Well, thank you all for uh, your, your presentations, your conversations, uh, your engagement, uh, and thank you everybody out in the audience. This is really wonderful. Um, there is a, a, a quick survey in uh, the chat, a link to a survey. If any, if folks wouldn't mind clicking on that and filling out the survey, we, we'd much appreciate it. And uh, we will uh, be coming at you in, uh, in April with another Religion and, Religion and Drugs, April 20th and look for the YouTube recording of, of this episode coming up pretty soon. Thank you again to our guests. Just add one thing, Raymond, oh, yeah, go ahead. one thing. I just want to invite all of you interested in the audience that we're going to have a wonderful um, international conference of religion and film in Hollywood, California and Pasadena. Mark your calendars now. It's going to be uh, late June, early July, 2024. So summer 2024, plan to join us for an international conference on religion and film. And Thank we'll you, put Jeanette. show notes, we'll put a link. <laughs> awesome. All right. Thanks to you all.